Our next speaker is another passionate and inspirational leader who won the Forbes Women Africa Sustainable Citizen Award in 2019. Judy Kefagona, purpose for the last 18 years of her life has been to create links between conservation, sustainable tourism, conservation and community development. She's not afraid to speak out about the things that she's passionate about and the things she believes. And many people here today would have heard her calls for sustainable, truly sustainable conservation and tourism. And considerations of human rights in the, in the tourism supply chain and the inclusion of more women in the industry as well. As well as being a passionate advocate and public speaker, Judy is also the founder of the Sustainable Travel and Tourism Agenda. She launched the Green Summit, the Green Tourism Summit in Africa in 2015, which aims to influence the sustainable growth of tourism. Judy also designs training modules for tourism professionals and develops the Young Change Makers Initiative for undergraduates at university studying tourism. This passion and dedication and action means that Judy has played a pivotal role in not only minimizing the negative impacts of tourism, but also moving it towards a sustainable, responsible and ethical industry. One of her most inspirational quotes that I found is that great places to visit must first and foremost be great places to live for the hosting communities. I think this truly encapsulates the spirit of this conference, where we're working together to create better futures for the diverse communities that are involved with conservation today. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome Judy Kefagona to the stage. And uh, thank you very much, Judy, for coming here today. Judy hasn't had to come so far, but it's a great honor that you're here today to speak to us. Thank you very much. Great, I don't need to introduce myself again this morning. Good morning. I, that was more than enough introduction. It's always awkward to listen to somebody talk about you when you sit it up there. Very awkward. So I'm not gonna talk about myself and I'll go straight into our presentation, discussions for this morning. Um, very interesting, uh, the, the theme for this uh, particular conference, Pathways Kenya 2020. It's about diverse voices. And I am glad that my voice has found its way here as one of the diverse voices. And I, I have a voice, a diverse voice, because I've been given a chance by many communities, particularly those in the Mara, to work with them in, in areas around uh, conservation. And today I stand here because they've given me the room the grass room, I always say, I have learned from the grass room in the Mara. It's the best place to run, under the trees, under the grasses. Uh, my pastoralist friends around here will tell you that there are many great lessons that have been learned in those grass rooms, and I love them and I appreciate them. And I want to thank all of them who've given me a chance to be able to learn with them and reflect. So today, mine is about a reflective voice a reflective voice of um, what I have had the opportunity to be present with, to work with, to listen to people in different places, many different voices in different places about communities and um, conservation, to observe the many players and their interests over many years now, and to be able to reflect and share those reflections. So what I'm going to share with us today are reflections that should help us think about community conservation going into the future. But I think the most important question that we will be answering at the end of today, I only have six slides to reflect on. 
They're not 20. <laughs> They're just six of them. They, uh, maybe five of them are significant questions. But at the end of the day, um, I want us to, to be able to reflect on how communities will navigate this very complex business of conservation. It's a very, very complex business. It has many interested groups, interests, and many players. It evolves depending on who, where you are, what time of uh, period in history we are at. And when I heard about uh, 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 Michelle talk about uh, uh, environment and human rights, it's so intertwined with human rights, but it's probably one of the, the, the forbidden topics that we don't talk about all the time, about human rights in conservation. We love to gloss over it, but it's probably one of the biggest issues that conservation should be paying attention to. And rights can be defined in very many different uh, uh, ways. Um, three weeks ago, um, I was in northern Kenya. I visited a private conservancy and a community conservancy. I was doing uh, an, an assessment for an organization on issues of sustainability. And um, I, some community members quietly came and told me, I, I love to ask questions and talk to people. So I asked them, so what's going on with your conservancy? What's current? And they told me, imagine they're telling us to sign up our land to an investor for 50 years. And the words were, imagine. And as soon as somebody says, imagine, it means that they have questions about it that they're thinking about it. So it started with, imagine they're telling us to do this for 50 years. So it's not like, imagine we are putting our land aside for 50 years. Imagine they are telling us to put aside our land for 50 years for uh, purposes of tourism investment. Then I asked one of them, I asked them, do you have a family? He said, yes, I do. So I say, how old is your oldest child? And he said, my oldest child is seven years old. It's a daughter. And then I have a, a son. So um, in 50 years, they will be 57, right? Yeah. 50 years is half a decade. And, and I asked her, him this question. The values for which the conservancies are created today. There are values, yes. We have to accept that, that they bring certain values to the table. Will these values hold for your daughter when she's 57? Let alone 57, when she's 25, when she's 30, when she's 18, will these values hold for her? And therefore, those discussions inspired my big question at the end of today whether community conservation, yeah, how community conservation can pursue a um, long-term value creation agenda that will make sense for that seven-year-old in 50 years. So how will we create value around conservancies to evolve, to resonate with that one who is seven years old today so that when this conservancy is here 50 years from now, they will still find value. And will value, the values that we described today, will they make sense for her in 50 years or in 25 years? And I think that is the biggest question for me, for conservation, community conservation. Hence the title of my presentation of communities and the dilemma of progressive conservation. Right? Progressive conservation in the context of community, therefore, is a shifting target. When I first uh, uh, got involved with conservation, my background is in development studies. 
and 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 my first job from college was with a humanitarian organization right um alleviating um pain and suffering of 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 communities or countries in terms of war and conflict um then I went from, from, from there, I, I developed uh, project management skills, interpersonal skills and relations. And that's where I found myself. My next job was at uh, Kenya Wildlife Service. And that was a very daring move for me. It was a very daring move for me because I didn't come from that background, but I became interested in how, how conservation can be used to alleviate the suffering or, or, or contribute to the well-being of rural communities. I was transferring some of the humanitarian things I had learned from a humanitarian organization. But since then, and that was more than 20 years ago, or just about that, I have, I have observed that the, the, the meaning of progressive conservation has changed continuously. There was a time when I, when I, when I first joined uh, uh, KWS where, where progressive conservation was basically about paying communities or compensation for human wildlife conflict. And that was the most important thing that everyone was talking about. Then it quickly, it quickly moved to sharing <coughs> benefits from conservation. And now you started hearing things about we need a percentage of conservation fee going back to communities. And we know of the um, Maasai Mara model. I think it was a Maasai Mara reserve model of sharing 19% with the community. It moved into sharing. Then we quickly moved into another dispensation where we were now talking about ownership and access. And today, as we stand here, we are basically talking about ownership, access, and management of natural resources. So it's not about uh, being on the periphery and waiting. It's about being right there, managing conservation spaces, owning those uh, uh, spaces, and having access to tourism revenue, and having access to development revenue all within the conservancy. So progressive, the word is progressive itself, has changed meaning for communities over time in conservation. And again, like I said earlier on, this change uh, uh, in meaning, to a certain extent, it has been driven from within the communities, but there's also been a lot of pressure from other interest groups. Sometimes those interest groups come with financing, and so we're putting in financing, and therefore, you've got to do what the financier has got to say or is interested for that particular time. So as we talk about, when, when we, as we move forward, and uh, whatever reflections I have, think about the change in the meaning of progressive conservation within the community context over time and where we are at today. And if, if you are working with communities today, Maybe it's a time to think, where are we at in terms of progressive? What are we talking about and how do you see? So I will move straight into talking about some of the dilemmas. Slide number two. Oh, we're going to miss that. Yeah. OK. So it's about the uh, community conservations and the, and the dilemma of progressive conservation. So what, is, what are these dilemmas? One of the dilemmas that I've come across is in the interpretation of a conservancy. The dilemma of interpretation of conservancy. I think in 2013, um, when the new act, the Kenya's um, Wildlife Management and Coordination Act 2019 uh, was passed, one of the new creations within that Act was an institution called the Community Wildlife Conservation and Compensation Committee. I had an opportunity to do some work with some conservation organization to go around the country and talk 
to these committees in different counties. And I think we need eight counties. And these are the counties that have got a lot of wildlife. And as early as that, the dilemma of interpretation had already began. This institution is called the Community Wildlife, County Wildlife Conservation and Compensation Committee, or the CWCCC, as we call it here in abbreviation. In all these meetings, the community representatives already had an issue with this name. What was their issue? They said they are trying to engage us in conservation because this was supposed to be like devolved, devolving conservation management to include uh, communities after uh, our devolved governance system from 2013 as a country. And they said, look at that name, that, that's abbreviations. Even in this new act, conservation comes before compensation. So it is a county wildlife conservation, then compensation. It, is, it, was, it was not meant to put our issues first. We have been included, but our issues are secondary to conservation. It's always about conservation. So this committee will first of all take care of conservation issues, which means the state has already given itself a position, even in an institution that is supposed to be ours. I say this is a reflective presentation. I'm reflecting on the various spaces where I have had voices while interacting with community. So even at that level, there were already voices, they were voicing that uh, we think this is not about us. We think this is about using us. And that is a dilemma of interpretation because somebody else sitting somewhere or the wildlife authorities must have thought that they have done, they have created an institution for inclusion. The community representatives so an inclusion, an, an institution for, for, for spearheading the government agenda of conservation before community. So the words, the community in there and our representation was just to make sure that the government um, achieves what it says. So the question is, and the dilemma that is about understanding and meaning in conservation is very huge. There's, there's meaning in what is described in law, and then there's understanding in those who are involved. How do they understand it? What does it mean for them? And that has been a dilemma. And we might think that it doesn't make, mean much, but, but if there is a dilemma of interpretation, it means that the person who has the power and authority, their interpretation takes the day. So if government interprets conservancy in a particular way, it will create laws in that particular way. It will not create laws in the way the community, the meaning of conservancy for the community. So then the questions that are pertinent that emerge in the dilemma of interpretation of the conservancy for the communities. I work with uh, Dixon, who's seated here much respected for conservation. I respect him a lot and what he has done for conservation. I had the opportunity to work alongside him as a respected community member in Masai Mara who had stood aside and had a voice those days, progressive voices that would include communities in conservation. And remember sitting uh, under the trees many times to negotiate with landowners for the formation of Nabosho Conservancy. And Dixon, if I can recall well, the voices that came from the communities, if I were to summarize them, I would say that communities were looking for an economic empowerment model that would help them to improve their livelihoods, that would help them to sustain their land and their livelihood. And do, do, out of that would come the value of conservation. So for them, conservation was at the end of the conservancy model. It was first and foremost an economic empowerment model that would help them improve their well-being and sustain their livelihood. And what livelihood were they talking about? 
they were talking about the Maasai tradition of owning land, large tracts of land, and the Maasai tradition of pastoralism. So for them, that was a conservancy. That was their understanding of what they were pursuing when they decided we're going to pull our land together and form this uh, um, uh, conservation area. In the eyes of a traditional conservationist, a conservancy is a conservation model led by communities. Those are two different ways of looking at a conservancy. It's a conservation model where communities are the landowners, and so they make the decisions. And so it is conservation that is community-led. That is what a conservancy is. But that is not what the communities wanted when they formed conservancies. They were looking for an economic empowerment model. So we faced with the dilemma of the interpretation of a conservancy in today's discussion around conservancies. Now, if you talk to somebody who comes from a, 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 a land rights background, they will tell you that a conservancy is a land management model, right? With community conservation benefits. It's a land management model. And, and I remember very well that uh, uh, in the early years of uh, um, forming Naboishu and other conservancies in the Mara, one particular uh, development, international development organization, held discussions and they say the title, the, the topics they were discussing, they were talking communities, the new land grab. Community conservancies, the new land grab in Kenya. Because they were looking at a conservancy as a land management model, which is not in the hands of the community because somebody else is paying for it. So they thought it was a new land grab model. So there is a dilemma of interpretation. And that dilemma of interpretation means that different interest groups are investing different energies in conservancies. If I come from uh, that background of, uh, of, of a land rights, I will be investing different energy in a conservancy if I get involved with them. If I come from the uh, 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 background of a development practitioner and I see it as an economic empowerment model, I will be investing different energies. If I see it as a, as a, as a conservation uh, model for, that is community-led, I will be investing different energies. And all this, the communities have to suck in and sieve out and find out what is genuine and what is working for us. This is the dilemma of the communities in the interpretation of conservancies. I haven't even talked about private sector and what they interpret the conservancy to be. For them, the conservancy is a destination. It's a prime destination which they sell at very high value. They price their properties that are in there very highly because for them it's a prime destination. Top of their list. And because that prime destination needs open spaces, then the management of land becomes second. And when those spaces are managed, then there is wildlife, which is the attraction. There is the prime value that they are selling. So then every time they see a conservancy, they see a prime destination. And their interest is in securing a prime destination. And the community has got to suck up all this and listen to everyone and make out who is genuine and who is for us. And it is overwhelming. It can be overwhelming for the communities. So hence my initial question. Okay, so we have the next dilemma. We've got the dilemma of the success metrics. Because of all those uh, different interest groups, this is the next dilemma that the community has got to deal with. So what, what is the su success metrics for a conservancy. Let me use a, a typical example of a, 
a primary school in Kenya. If you were to evaluate a primary school in Kenya for success, it's very clear what you need to be looking out for. First of all, you will be looking at enrollment at pre-primary one, what we call PP1 today. How many are they enrolling? You will be looking at the gender balance in that enrollment. Post-enrollment, you will be looking at transition. How many transition from PP1 to class one, to class two, to class three? So, so there is enrollment, and then there is transition, then there is the gender balance, which is not a very big matrix, but is in there. And last and, and most important is the performance at the class eight, what they do, what is their mean score. It's so clear, it's in black and white. We know how to measure success in a primary school in Kenya. So do we know how to measure success of a conservancy? I keep hearing this statement all the time, that the, uh, the success of the conservancy can be variously described. When it can be variously described, then it is a dilemma because it's not clear. And depending on whose interests and who is communicating, they will decide that the success matrix is the number of tourists who came. The success matrix is the number of wildlife that we are seeing in the rangeland. It's the number of dollars that we are paying the landowners. Because it is variously, success can be variously described depending on where we are. And I hear that all the time when you ask about the success metrics. So we have a challenge. Can we define the true success metrics of a conservancy? Just the way I have described. If, if I were to tell these uh, metrics for measuring success of a primary school in Kenya, nobody will dispute it, right? They will not tell me it's variously. Yeah. We can talk about other things when we start saying that, okay, the performance will depend on whether they are in the city or whatever, maybe those cities have advantages, yes. But it is very clear that it starts with enrollment, it goes into transition, then we are talking performance. So how does it look like for a community consultant? What is a success matrix for a community consultant? Is it the number of years they put in for conservation? Is it the number of beneficiaries? Is it... It's not clear. And, 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 and we must get to a point where the success metrics of a, of a conservancy, if we're truly talking about um, a sustained value in the long term for a conservancy, it has to become extremely clear for the seven-year-olds when they're 25 and when they're 57. Right. So, so, so most of the time we, we, we talk about um, numbers, but right there I have that very, this very interesting photo, because for the communities, this is a success metric that my heart has grown, is <laughs> a success metric. But it, does, it is not reported because it is not the community that is reporting or have determined the success metrics of a conservancy. A modern house for a landowner in the Mara will be a success matrix. A modern house for tourism practitioner in these places will be a disruption of the destination. The destination doesn't look authentic anymore. People are building modern houses. So what is the true success metrics? The landowner is saying, I can rely on tourism to a certain extent, but I still need my livestock. So I need to invest in it. Success metrics for some of the younger generations in the Mara will be like, I have this nice house and I have now fenced my land and I have this pasture. How do we tell them, how do we convince them that this is not a success matrix? And that the values that we're talking about can be their values as well. 
So it is a dangerous zone if we cannot have everybody on the same page in as far as definition of success metrics, we're going to face conflicts in community conservation. And we've already seen it emerging in places in the Mara. Who would have thought that uh, Mara will be dealing with issues now, programs to bring down fences? Because that landowner, the, the success metrics were not clearly defined from the beginning. So you guaranteed me income, I got my income. I have seen people fencing land. The affluent in society always fence their land. I want to be identified with a certain class. So I'm going to fence my land. Just because it was not clear to me, nobody defined what the success metrics were going to be for the community and for the tourism partner. The tourism investors know what their success metrics are from day one when they entered the conservancy. They know how they're going to measure and how it's going to change with them. They can even calculate where they will be in the 15 years when the time the first lease has ended or another 20 years. But the conservancy, the landowners are adapting things as they go along. And then it becomes difficult to start telling them that this is not a success metric. So this is another dilemma that we have with progressive conservation today. Okay. Then I have what I call the success, the, 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 the dilemma of choice. And the dilemma of choice has to do with how many choices a landowner has to make in community conservancies versus the choices that other interest groups have to make. Other interest groups have to make one or two or three choices. The community landowners has to make hundreds of choices. How much land do I put aside in the conservancy? Sorry. Yeah? How much land do I put aside for the conservancy? Where will I live, right? Shall I fence this land or not? How many years is good enough for me? What shall I use to measure success? What shall I tell my children when it's time for them to subdivide this land and they have become of age and they want their land? What shall I tell them? How can I convince them about a value of putting aside 25 years or 50 years? Shall I continue to keep livestock? Where will they graze? Everybody is fencing. What shall I do? Am I going to be cattleless in a little while? Yeah? This money that I'm getting from um, uh, conservation, where can I invest it? Can I buy a piece of land in the trading center and build a little lodging? And then it will be called a shanty town by tourism. Then I have to leave open corridors. There's already land I have put aside in the conservancy. Then I have to. The community has choices to make, and it's not one and it is not two. There are many, many choices that they have to make. And this will have an implication on what progressive conservation should look like. Do we have answers to this question? Are they for the short term or the long term? Where is the value addition? So that when we are answering this question for the, for the, for the uh, landowner who has put the land in conservation for 25 years or 30 years, it can make meaning to them. Then there's always the other question. Will I benefit more if I'm in the inner circle? By the inner circle, I mean the those who are in conservancy leadership, yeah. Should I secure myself by finding myself a position in the inner circle? Because maybe there the benefits are more. Yeah? Will I be allowed to invest in tourism? Can I invest in tourism? We have seen some community members trying to invest in tourism, and it's not easy. 
it's not easy if it is within the boundaries of a conservancy and all that. So the, the, there's the dilemma of choice. The, 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 the first uh, generation of, uh, of landowners who signed in land on behalf of their families are daily grappling with these questions and more. Daily. Because these are realities of life. They are just like any of us. They're thinking about their children and they're thinking about their future and they're thinking about many things and they're thinking about progress. So we have the problem of dilemma of choice. And that's tormentation that happens from within can have implications in the outside. Am I on my fifth slide? Yes, I'm almost done. <laughs> It's my fault. Yeah. So there's the dilemma of the new conflicts in community-driven conservation. This is a scene, I think, from somewhere in Maranot Nabosho in 2019. And this picture was in Al Jazeera. This statement, I think it's October 2019. There was this headline, and it was a feature on Al Jazeera. You can actually find it. It says, Landspark threatens Kenya's wildlife conservation in Masai Mara. Kenya's successful conservation model, that's the conservancy, which has protected wildlife for decades, may be on the verge of crumbling. And that, that, that particular piece uh, feature on Al Jazeera finished by saying that uh, community conservation is a vicious circle. It's a vicious circle. We, it's almost going back to where protected area conservation started, right? But now we have new conflicts. In the past, it was state versus community. The state, the community is protesting, or oh, we're not getting something from conservation. There is human wildlife conflict. It was state and community. Today, we have progressive conservation. The conflicts have evolved. We have community to community conflict. And it played out big time in the Mara in 2019. Community to community conflict. So there is indeed a new contested space in community conservation. When, whenever we have conflict, there's always a contested space. So there is a new contested space in community conservation. And it is about leadership, elitism, it's about authority, it's about power, it's about control. This is the new contested space. It's no longer the government and what you're paying us and what you're not giving us. We are managing, remember we are in the dispensation where we own and we're managing, right? The conflicts have changed. It was easier for a lot of us sitting around the room to deal with a, a state and community conflict. Because we always moved in and said, we will empower the community, we will support them to do advocacy, we will turn against the state, we will lobby for changing policy, we will do this. It was easy when it was state and community conflict. When it's community and community conflict, the interventions have to change. And so which community do you support and which one don't you support? And how do we go through? I found myself in this situation in 2019, and it's not a, it's not a comfortable one. Yeah, I'm looking at Dixon. It was a difficult one. It was not anticipated. But so it's something that we have to think about going into the future, about community conservation. Because the, the contested spaces will evolve. But we know for sure from this conflict from 2019 that there is a new contested space in community-led conservation. And this is the dilemma of the new conflicts. The community themselves, I think, in this whole conflict were very confused. They will sit down and talk to each other and we are brothers and we can do this. And then they go out and then they do this. Then they come back and talk to each other again. That is why it's a dilemma. They also were not anticipating that this would happen to them. And I would sit in some of those meetings and they would say, we are brothers, we know how to fight ourselves from within. We will find our way out of this, but it's not been easy. It's not been easy. 
It's been going on and on and on and on. So there is a new dilemma of these conflicts that are within uh, uh, the communities. And like I said, the, the, the source and the, the genesis of the conflict has changed. What is contested has changed. And so it is time to prepare for this if indeed we are going to secure these spaces for the next generations, 25 and 50 years. Okay? Almost coming to my last slide. My last slide is, uh, second last slide is a question. This conflict, this is just a summary of conflicts from my reflections and interactions. So what is the long-term promise of the community conservancy model? And it's particularly in the human dimensions. What should that look like? What should the long-term promise of the conservancy model look like? We have had the short-term promises of you know, there's wildlife, there's secured land, there's the protection of wildlife, there's a little bit of buzzer here, there is, you can access a little bit of greasy. But truly, what is the long-term process promise? What is the long-term promise for that seven-year-old today? What does the conservancy model hold for her 50 years from today? These are the things, these are the questions we should be asking ourselves. What does it hold for her? Does it, does it mean no poverty? Does it mean equality? What does the conservancy model promise in the long term? Does it promise new partnerships? Does it promise decent work? Does it promise response to climate action? I don't know. This is the answers we have to find for the future. What is that long term promise that will help us to address some of those new and emerging dilemmas today that are threatening the future of our community conserved areas? And so we come to an end. That's our big question. How can conservancies pursue a long-term value creation agenda in the complex business of conservation amidst emerging complex challenges or dilemmas for the community? If we reflect on this going forward, we probably could have found some answers to secure this conservation model into the future. We will probably have cracked the human dimensions of community-led conservation. Thank you for listening to me. Giving me a Before we let Judy escape, um, there's probably time for a few questions. I'm sure you've all got burning questions after that wonderful talk. So if you don't mind just taking a few questions from people. Is there anybody who has a question? I don't know whether I have the answers, but we can ask. There we go. <laughs> yes. Anybody else can answer, yeah. Uh, thank you, Judy, for that presentation. I was just, it got me thinking about, when you talk about playing on the success metric, and I, was, I wanted to know your thoughts on, in your experience, whether you think there's room for multiple measures of success. Yes. But looking at all these interest groups and how that can play out, will it be a detriment to conservation or will it be a progressive conservation? Okay. Okay. If I could take that right away, I think uh, there is room for multiple measures. What we must not forget, yeah, is the primary player. How do we incorporate the metrics of the primary player? Yeah, how do we prepare them um, mentally or psychologically, economically, in all ways, socially, to be able to define their own metrics of success? That is the most important question because the primary player in this model is the landowner. So his metrics or her metrics must count. I keep referring to the seven-year-old, her metrics must count. So we must think, we must think 50 years and start coming backwards. What will it look like for her in 50 years? 
what, what kind of person will she be in 50 years? What type of metrics will make sense for her and for which we can relate to conservation? And convincingly so, without questioning whether it are metrics or not, just like we, we can't question the metrics of success of a primary school, that she will not be able to question and she will see it very clearly that this makes sense. So yes, there is room for multiple uh, metrics for measuring success. Yeah. Uh, Judy, thank you very much for that uh, thought-provoking presentation. Uh, my name is Cosmos. Uh, I have a question regarding the 50-year thing. Uh, I have this belief that every generation is born with an innate ability mm -hmm. to be able to solve its own problems. And sometimes maybe we can try and jump the gun by trying to um, solve a problem that probably in that time frame we might not be able to, the dynamics would have changed completely. Uh, how does it play uh, in this dilemma of uh, you know, generational changes? I think, I think the most important thing is to continuously, in my view, um, I, we can uh, listen to other views, is to continuously uh, create value. So we, we are continuously looking at what does value look like five years from today? We started the conservancies five years ago. Can we revisit the values? Instead of assuming that uh, when we sign a conservancy lease in 2010, that in 2040 we have not revisited what that values and any value addition around that particular time. And I do agree with you that every generation comes with the innate ability to be able to deal uh, with their issues. But also, it is, not, uh, it is not a recipe for us to leave behind chaos so that they can start dealing with chaos. They, sh they should build on something that was already there. And, and it is those blocks, how far can we build? How far can we build for them? The things that, you, you know, they say generations change, but values don't change. Yeah? Generations change, and they solve different pro uh, they solve problems differently. But there's certain things that are uh, uh, human values that remain. And will they be able to see that value that their parents saw in the conservancy? Yeah? That's my try. <laughs> it's not an answer, it's a try. Yeah, I just tried. Any more questions? Yes. Um, maybe I want to They can't buy a huge chunks of land from the community and pay good price. So that is more lucrative than the you know the little amount of money that they have received. So how do you think that should be mitigated going forward? That is a tough one because that is always uh, an issue of sometimes it is personal, especially when the land is owned uh, by an individual. But if they can see value, again, I keep going back to seeing value in a long-term uh, conservancy model, the way we have them today, then maybe they will rethink. Today, I didn't talk about something that uh, I'm reflecting on, and um, someday I get another platform, I will speak about it, and I call it predatory financing in conservation, or predatory funding. Predatory funding is a risk for community-led conservation in this country. And it's a whole different subject. We can't talk about it now, but I am doing my, currently collecting my reflections around it. But those are the kind, that is the kind of predatory. You know, you predate upon somebody who has no choices and you have money. Yeah? So predatory investors, predatory financing is a risk for community-led conservation in this country. And it is, it, is, it is one of those taboo topics, but someday I will speak about it somewhere else. <laughs> thank you, and thank you again, Judy. And we look forward to hearing more thoughts from you in the future. Thank you. Um, <laughs>